All right, let's talk adrenal glands. So first thing I always call the adrenal glands the hats of the kidneys because they sit on top of the kidneys. Uh, so you could guess that the kidneys are going to influence the adrenal glands function in some way or another. We're going to see that here in a little second. But first, in the adrenal gland itself, we separate it out into two main parts because those two parts will have different hormones that they'll be secreting. So the first part on the outside is obviously called the cortex. Anytime we use the word cortex, whether it's in the adrenal glands or the brain, it's on that outer layer, right? And then on the inside, we're going to call this the medulla. And that's the same thing in the uh, kidneys itself. So if you look at the kidneys, we got a cortex on the outside and the inside part of the kidneys is the medulla. So they are very anatomically similar, okay? Now we're gonna start with the medulla and what it secretes because it's a little more simple. And it's going to start in the central nervous system, specifically in the uh, hypothalamus of the brain. So the hypothalamus, we know, is the main regulator of homeostasis, right? Starts with the H, I remember homeostasis. Now, anytime you have any sort of fight or flight uh, information coming in, what I mean by that, if something uh, stressful is happening, maybe a tiger is running at you, or even something as simple as internally, maybe you have low blood glucose levels, okay? Any sort of thing that could potentially be dangerous to you, you're going to be in fight or flight stimulation. What does that mean? Well, we're going to stimulate, as obviously, the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic neurons are going to prepare your body for fight or flight. We know that it dilates your pupils. We know that it increases your heart rate and so forth and so on. But we're going to have the adrenal glands help promote the function of the sympathetic nervous system. What do I mean by that? Well. When the hypothalamus lights up for fight or flight, it's going to go and innervate some neurons in the thoracic region, because your sympathetic neurons lie in your uh, thoracic and your lumbar region from T, I believe T2 down to L4. So we're gonna have a sympathetic neuron here in the spinal cord, and that sympathetic neuron is gonna get triggered to come and talk directly to the adrenal medulla, okay? And this sympathetic neuron in blue is going to release stimulatory neurotransmitters, usually epinephrine, and it's going to tell the adrenal medulla, yo, hey, we need something secreted. We're in fight or flight. We need to help amplify this effect. So what the adrenal medulla will produce as a hormone is epinephrine. Now, this is interesting. <clears throat> epinephrine, in this case, is dumped into the bloodstream from the adrenal medulla. So we consider this epinephrine a hormone. But you may have heard just a second ago that I said this is the neurotransmitter being released by the sympathetic nervous system is also epinephrine. But that's a neurotransmitter. It's making a small effect on a few cells, whereas the adrenal medulla cells release it as a hormone, which now it can go in the bloodstream and go everywhere, right? We know anytime something gets in the bloodstream, it's going to go everywhere. So <clears throat> that's going to have a wide variety of effects on different body tissue. So let me just give you a list of things that the epinephrine does as a hormone specifically. Number one, <clears throat> it's going to raise your blood glucose levels. And that's in a variety of effects. It's going to talk to the liver, say, hey, break down your glycogen. It's going to reconvert fatty, uh, fatty acids as well as amino acids into energy, uh, amino acids into glucose, fatty acids just being used as energy as well. It's also going to go and talk to your heart. It's going to increase your heart rate because this is actually a, it's a ionotropin, so it's a calcium channel opener. So it's basically going to increase the contractility of the heart as well as stimulate it to beat actually faster. Um, epinephrine will also help other um, sympathetic regions. So basically it'll dilate your lungs. So dilate the bronchial tubes. So it opens up your lungs a little better. And then lastly, I'm blanking on this for a second. Uh, it's going to actually vasoconstrict a lot of your muscular arteries. Now the goal of that vasoconstriction basically means narrowing of those vessels, and that's going to increase your blood pressure. So a great example of this hormone in action is if you get cut off in traffic and you're driving and you swerve and you, you're basically alive, luckily, hopefully, um, but right afterwards, you feel your heart starting to beat faster and harder. Your blood pressure increases. You're kind of stressed, right? That's the effect that epinephrine is having as a hormone because it's going to everywhere affecting a whole slew of body tissues, okay? So that is the adrenal medulla, okay? It releases epinephrine and a little bit of norepinephrine, but mostly epinephrine. Great.
Now the cortex is a little more complicated, a little more complicated. So the cortex is going to secrete three different things in three different times. So let me just give you what they'll secrete and we'll talk about when they are produced. So number one will be aldosterone. You may see in the textbook, this is called a mineral corticoid. Because it's actually going to affect some minerals and reabsorption of them. The second one will be cortisol. Which you may see as a glucocorticoid. And then the last one is going to be androgens. <clears throat> which actually means like male stimulation for different sexual characteristics, but they're also produced by females as well. So these are the three that will be secreted by the adrenal cortex, but they're released in different times and for different functions, which makes sense, right? The first one, aldosterone. Aldosterone, this is going to help reabsorb water and sodium chloride, so salt. Now, why would we want to reabsorb water and salt? Well, aldosterone is released in response to, you may have heard of the RAS system, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So what's interesting is, is when this system is triggered, angiotensin-2 will be released. And I do have a video on the RAS system if you want to watch that on YouTube. But when angiotensin-2 is released, it makes a wide variety of effects, and it actually tells the adrenal cortex to begin producing aldosterone. But once again, the question is, why are we wanting to release aldosterone? Well, when is the RAS triggered? In response to low blood volume or low blood pressure. So what happened is we have low blood pressure, that's potentially dangerous, we could die from that, and the kidneys don't like to decrease their filtration rate, which is influenced heavily by blood volume. So, in response, the kidneys release renin. Renin does a whole slew of things, produces angiotensin II, then tells the adrenal cortex, hey, release aldosterone so we can reabsorb water and salt because that will help increase our blood volume, right? Now, this happens at the kidneys itself. So, aldosterone will go to the kidneys and tell the kidneys to reabsorb that water and salt, all right? It acts specifically on the distal convoluted tubule, helps increase some sodium, um, pumps as well as some uh, symports. But one issue, one issue with aldosterone is that it also helps excrete two things. Number one, hydrogen ions. Number two, potassium ions. So when you are excessively uh, making aldosterone, so for example, if this RAS is constantly being triggered and aldosterone is constantly being produced, you're actually losing hydrogen ions, which could cause you to become alkaline, your blood to become alkaline. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Furthermore, you could also lose some potassium, which could lead to hypokalemia, which is low potassium levels in the blood plasma. So that's one issue that aldosterone could make. Um, but once again, main goal of aldosterone in response to low blood volume, let's reabsorb some salt and water at the kidneys so that we can bump up that blood volume. Cool. So there's aldosterone, right, and the mineral corticoid. Now cortisol, cortisol. This is heard of your stress hormone, but it's actually secreted pretty chronically. So you actually have cortisol in your system all the time uh, because it helps you basically stay alive and be regulated specifically with blood sugar. Now, uh, let me talk about that a little bit. So first off, in the hypothalamus, we know that the hypothalamus releases things called releasing hormones. Releasing hormones that will talk specifically to the anterior portion of the pituitary gland right there, okay? That anterior pituitary gland will release something called ACTH. This is called adrenocorticotropic hormone. Big old word, adrenocortico. That means the cortex of the adrenal glands. Tropic means we're going to act on a structure to tell it to make its hormone, okay? So adrenocorticotropic hormone travels to the adrenal cortex, and tells the adrenal cortex to then release cortisol. Okay, so that's when it is released. Okay, so it's a hormonal control. So ACTH tells the adrenal cortex make cortisol. What does cortisol do? Well, let's list a couple of things. Number one, just like epinephrine, it's going to help increase your blood glucose levels. Okay, making it more available to your tissues. Second thing is it'll actually suppress your immune system. 
So this is one reason. So if you're stressed all the time, you're going to have, excuse, sorry about that. If you're stressed all the time, hypothalamus actually releases more and more releasing hormones to make more and more ACTH to make more and more cortisol. So when you're chronically stressed, you're actually more susceptible to getting infections because you're making cortisol and it's actually telling your B cells, don't make as many antibodies. We're okay. We're focusing our energies elsewhere. All right. So it's kind of bad in excess. And then the last thing, I want to double check my textbook really fast. Um, da, 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 da. It's an anti-inflammatory too, and it helps also, let's see here. It helps also to increase epinephrine receptors. This is actually considered a synergistic um, interaction. So basically epinephrine, what was one of the goal, right? Increase blood sugar, right? Increase heart rate, all these things that are preparing you for fight or flight. So if there's a stressful situation and cortisol is released, it's going to synergistically work so that epinephrine receptors are increased so epinephrine can make a stronger action on different body tissues, which is kind of cool, all right? <clears throat> so that's cortisol released with uh, hypothalamus once again, response to stress, makes ACTH to the cortex, makes the cortisol, cortisol does all these sort of things. The last one will be these androgens, okay? Now, I don't know a ton about these, but what I will say is one androgen is called DHEA, okay? <clears throat> I think it's like dihydroxyester or something, whatever, doesn't really matter. But what this is, is a precursor. So DHEA, DHEA and all these other androgens are precursor sex hormones. So DHEA can be converted to several different things, including testosterone, including estrogen, etc. Okay, because androgens are a steroid-based hormone. In fact, all of these guys are steroid-based hormones, so they're fat-soluble. Um, they actually go to the nucleus of cells to make their effect. Um, but in this case, we're going to have a precursor so that, say, uh, I don't know, your uh, testes, for example, need some... Uh, need some bare bones to work with to produce more testosterone, DHEA can do that. 